This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Recorded on Monday, February 3rd, 2014, in St. Louis, Missouri, This Agile Life, Episode 36, A Larger 3%. Get your very own People Work Here t-shirt at booster.com slash thisagilelife. Say it loud and wear it proud. The software industry transforms more and more every day. Agile methods are quickly replacing traditional ones. The question is, are you agile enough? This podcast is devoted to agile and lean software development. Time to welcome your agile coaches on This Agile Life. Hello, everyone. I'm the host of This Agile Life, John Sextro. Joining me today are my co-host, Jason Tice. Hi, John. How are we doing tonight? Doing great, Jason. How are you? I'm doing well, John, and I cannot wait for tonight's topic. I've been looking forward to it for a full year. Oh, I know you have. So like, much it's so. It's like a software release. You should do it once a year, right? That's the only no. time you should ever do it. No. You've been so looking forward to this that you prematurely announced it about three months ago. Yes, because of a very bad marketing email I received that was sent for reasons that we don't understand. Jason, also joining us tonight is Nate Mackey. Hi, John. Hi, Nate. Glad to have you on the show. Yeah, good to be here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Last but not least, Amos King. This night makes me grumpy, but that's why I'm here. This night makes you grumpy? The, the State of Agile survey makes me grumpy, but that's why I'm here. Amos, the state of Agile survey is like <laughs> being an American. It's about freedom of speech and also the law of two feet. If you don't like it, you can leave and disconnect. <laughs> well, why don't we find out what the state of Agile is, Jason? Oh, so you've thrown this to me. Who do we have to thank for the wonderful state of Agile 2013 so for those of you that don't know, uh, every year, version one does a survey. <laughs> and oh, sorry, I was beefing up the name of the company. Well, for, no, to their credit, version one invests and they do a survey and they, they, they solicit inputs from really practitioners. You can sign up on their website. Um, I know in the past, I took the survey for the past three years. I believe John's taken it. And they push data out about trends and really what they've learned and, and how Agile has changed over the course of a calendar year. So this, uh, this year's survey dropped recently. And the, the first thing that I thought I'd throw out there is uh, not a lot seemed to change between last year and this year. Can I ask which one of us took the survey this year? Okay, Jason did. Because I took three quarters of the survey the first year, and I decided three days in that it was time for me to stop. You know, I didn't even get the link this year, and I took the survey I, last year. Yeah, I didn't get the link this year either. I think it's because I stopped taking the survey halfway through last year. I got hmm. the link and did not take the survey. All right. Okay, so... So we have some sampling issues where we have four excellent people who could have sh provided inputs to help the community improve, and only one of them followed through. And it's the one of us who never sleeps. I think your, your premise is faulty. <laughs> okay, Nate, explain. <laughs> Why is my premise faulty? Your premise that by taking this survey, we could improve the Agile community. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that's true. Yes, it's not just me against Tice anymore. <laughs> well, okay, but but the, so what I see in this survey, and I, th Nate, this even goes along with a few things you were saying, is that the thing this survey does is it does provide a lot of information about what people are doing, and most importantly, if you're going to get started, what should you do, and what should you focus on? I think that's great, and knowing that this is an industry that we're all involved in, things change from time to time. New tools, new ideas, and so doing a check somewhere, there's some ideas, and if you know, if you're just someone who is getting started, you're, you know, you're talking to vendors, you're talking to consultants or coaches, this is a great way to have some additional data for the, for the market to use at its own, at its own discretion. Uh, honestly, the, the reason I didn't take the survey, it, among the fact that it would take a while to take it, was that I feel like our company is different from, is so different from 
all these other companies that are taking the survey that our results would kind of muddy the waters? Because I feel like, and I don't know if they asked this question, I don't really see it in here, is what kinds of companies are, are these people involved in? Are they, you know, is this corporate IT, which I get the sense most of it is, or is it, you know, a, a place like us where we we do projects for lots of different kinds of clients and we do agile different kinds of ways in those different situations because the clients are different. And I just feel like my answers to these questions would be so murky that I would just not really provide much value. So that's well, I, one of my reasons. I, I kind of felt the same way as you did, Nate, is that uh, last year when I was taking it, First of all, like halfway through it, I thought, holy cow, how many more questions are they going to ask me here? But also a lot of the questions talk about, you know, have you have you done Agile for two to five years, for five years? And most of us on this podcast have been doing Agile for close to 10 years or more. And, and I didn't feel like a lot of the multiple choice questions even had choices that I would choose. Yeah. Well, but some of that goes down to, and if, if you remember the infamous, ep- or the infamous episode from last year, uh, you know, I think Nate, you're you're picking on something that I faulted it was a, an opportunity to improve the survey. That was doing the correlation to say if you're doing a project or you're doing agile in this vertical, what are the challenges, and to have that breakout, which right. they they didn't get into last year, and also for the sake of doing a kind of a comprehensive survey, they didn't get into this year either. So I think that. That's still there as an opportunity to for uh, for improvement to provide a little bit a little bit more fine grained data, but at the same time, I'm learning to see value in this because it does it provides a way that if you're just getting started, you can get a lot of information that's supported by some data that's been reported by industry. Right, exactly, and I you know I don't have a problem with them doing this. Survey. I'm just saying that I'm not sure my input would be that valuable just based on where I am in the industry. I, I hear what you're saying. They they did ask some demographic information, and according to the survey, they've compiled that into a brief statement that they had organizations varying from just a single person all the way up to you know hundreds to a hundred thousand people as the largest, and that three quarters came from smaller organizations where they had fewer than a thousand employees. But uh, well, I, I, I think that's most organizations in general have fewer than a thousand employees, though, right? So demographically, that might be pretty accurate. Okay, but I understand Nate's point of view that the company he works for is kind of different. They do different, you know, have a different approach to things in terms of being consult a consultant project based company. So, well, the other thing that I'm going to throw out there, John, just you know, in defense of some of you know the, my ideas I had last year when we looked at the survey, and just things I've learned since then. There's a reason why a vendor would go to this this go to this um, you know put a survey out like this, and obviously because they get they get a lot of data from the people that submit it, and I'm sure they use that to for internal sales and you know ways to drive the way they want to build their tool and they want to position their tool going forward. So, I mean, I could understand they invested the money and the time to do the survey. They might want to keep some of that data for internal use. Right. So they ignore that 23 percent development staff that responded to the survey. Because they don't write the checks, uh, Avis, I, <laughs> Avis. I don't think it's fair to say that. I, uh, I'm just playing my devil's advocate again. Uh, like last year, I thought that the survey had beautiful infographics, and like you said, not only did the numbers not change a lot this year, but uh, the infographics look the same as last year. So I'm not near as impressed as I was. Well, let, let me ask you this, Amos. So, so what do you think about the numbers not changing? Is that good? Is that bad? Uh, what do you think? Uh, I. I, th- I think that as this is put out by a single company and not an independent organization, that they they target who they're going to send it to. And that's that's not a bad thing. I mean, all uh, surveys are targeted. So I, I don't expect a whole lot of change. But I also think that, that worldwide, maybe we aren't experiencing a lot of change. Maybe more people, but same sort of percentages. So in the Jason, in Jason, sorry, in the uh, in the bluff, or the uh, bottom line up front, as we used to say, the executive summary. The as tear off. Yes, go for it. Yeah, the tear off. There's there's quite a few examples where they call out some significant changes, and I'd just like to review a couple of those. 
with you guys. One of them, Amos, I think you'll be interested in because it is right in your wheelhouse. More distributed teams are practicing agile. More than that, that figure doubled this year. More than doubled, went from 35% up to 76%. Okay, but I got What page is that on? It's on the first page, Amos. What? He, he didn't get past the, uh, <laughs> the cover. It's not on the fr- what? No, it's not on the first page. Under, well, it's under current practices and tools. But here's the challenge with that is uh, practicing agile. What does that mean? Yeah. Oh, it was hidden. It wasn't under a beautiful infographic. That's right. It was just in some. Uh, I only read pictures. <laughs> I learned to read from my five year old. It's, it's a matter of <laughs> people self rating, Jason. They didn't necessarily define agile in the survey per se, but they said, do you, does your, do you have a remote team that uses agile? A well, distributed I think team, that's sorry. a lot of what this survey is trying to do is define what Agile is. Um, you know, as, as we talk about people over process is, is we like surveys like this, questions that we ask, it's really hard to talk about people and not process, right? So, so we're defining Agile, which says it's people over process in terms of processes and tools. And I think that is the big problem that I have with this is that every team is different. The way people work is different and that's okay. Yeah, Let's and embrace it, that and learn from each other. Yeah. And Amos, to that point, I think that's why you see the huge spike in, you know, people practicing agile, be it distributed or not. Uh, that to me just demonstrates people have heard the word. People said, yes, we're practicing agile, but at the same time, there isn't a lot of rigor behind what that actually means. I mean, to me, this is where, and I know once upon a time we had a, a, an episode, we talked about the idea of assessing agile maturity, but I mean, to really add some, add some rigor to this type of a survey, this is go into an environment, show me your continuous integration server. Oh, you don't have one. Hmm. Maybe you're not practicing agile, you know, show me your test coverage, you know, that's, and that's a debated practice. Show me your workflow. Do you write tests before you write the code? The answer, if you can't answer yes to that, you got to ask yourself, are you practicing agile? The fact that these numbers don't jolt up or down in any one direction to me is, I think, encouraging because it's demonstrating that this is not a fad, that um, people aren't maybe just self-reporting as agile because it's like the flavor of the month. Maybe people are slowly but surely this is gaining continuous momentum and kind of starting to snowball a little bit rather than just being this oh my god you know the gartner report says that 90 percent of projects now use agile i think there's truth to that john i mean it, it kind of shows that the you know that the craft of agile is established it's um it's growing people are interested in it and with that growth comes all the challenges of growth so you know there's there's a little of, call it pollution of the brand. You know, what does it really mean? And I'd say with that comes opportunities. I mean, opportunities for people to learn and opportunities to figure out from the values of, and principles of Agile what is most relevant for their context. Yeah, and I think it's reasonable that Agile is going to grow, just like anything, it's going to grow to a certain size where the growth rate just can't continue to climb dramatically. So, you know, it, it probably, to me, it means that it's kind of reached the point where it's fairly widespread and it, it could grow, but it's not going to grow at, at huge amounts so that any growth that happens is going to have to be enormous to really impact percentages once you get to a certain size. There comes, there comes Nate with the uh, statistics knowledge bomb. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, let me, let me, ask, let me ask John a question. So, John, you're a coach. Um, so, you know, one of the things they highlighted that changed was the increase of retrospectives. And they said it increased by 10% from last year. <laughs> Yay! Um, Yay! Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> well, so here's my question, Amos. You have that reaction. Why, why do you think teams don't do retrospectives to the point that it shows up here in the survey as being one of the things that they've seen the most increase of? Uh, trust and uh the, the ability for a management to say that it's okay. I think that 
that many teams um, and management in general says, well, why do I want to take two hours to do this or an hour to do this? Uh, I've worked with many teams in the past. They're like, hey, we should do this once a month. And then they come into the retro and they have a list like four pages long that we never get through. We're there for four or five hours. People are exhausted and they just want to get back to work. And then they say, well, let's, we'll meet again in four weeks. Well, if your list is that long, you need to meet more often. And I think that's the big thing is that people don't want to make that time commitment. Uh, they don't realize the big benefit out of it. Well, or, or that's in some instances, you could say that's a retrospective problem because if a retrospective generates a long list of stuff to do, well, it needs to be prioritized somehow. And, and maybe that's a way to have a retro that's more focused on generating an outcome or on generating well, an outcome. Hopefully, like, I think the other thing is getting someone in your organization to start that ball rolling. And hopefully we on this podcast are reaching enough people that more organizations start that ball rolling. Because if we're all doing them, we'll all be able to get better and we'll all learn from each other. Yeah, Amos, I think the number went up because we've talked about retrospectives so many times on this Agile Life that people are using them more and more now. And so it's all because of us. Well, that's good. All 18 listeners. <laughs> hey, Thank so you, guys. Here's something, that, here's something that does bother me on this Agile Techniques Employed graph. They've got little sad faces next to the things that went down since 2012. And the things that went down are refactoring, TDD, collective code ownership, and analog task board. I don't really care about that. But it's the other, the other three that refactoring TDD. And it, it just means that if the number of people grew using Agile, then it, they're using it and they're not also including refactoring TDD and collective code ownership, which are all, you know, they're all XP prac based practices, maybe you could argue, but I, that is kind of bothersome. I have to wonder if uh, TDD went down because people, like less people are actually uh, doing TDD or if more people have realized that if they write the test after they've written the code, it's not TDD. Oh, that they just know what TDD is. Yeah, they, like because I've been in a lot of shops where they said, "Oh yeah, we're doing TDD," and then you sit down with them and they write a bunch of code and then they write a bunch of tests. Yeah, and you're like, whoa, "Whoa, that's not TDD." That, I mean, that's the problem with this survey anyway. Is that all of these words mean different things to different people, and unless they're unless they are a defining them and b the people are actually reading those definitions when they do take the survey, it's hard to even know. Because I mean, I'm surprised that there's 30 percent doing pair programming. That, that, I, I it, didn't, didn't you guys on the previous podcast, didn't you ask how many, how many groups do you think are doing pair programming? And I think, yeah, that, I think it's about like 5%. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I think it's like maybe 10, 30%. Well, that just makes me feel I, like I don't know what pair programming is. Well, well and, and how, how much are they pair programming? Does yeah, this mean right. like in the past year, I sat down at a computer with somebody once? Exactly. So um, that's it. The other thing I was going to throw out there, if you correlate the data between both years, um, they had well, they had fewer developers take the survey this year. So you might have had people not responding uh -huh. to those questions because they simply, they're focused more on the process or yeah. on a project management discipline since they're, <laughs> maybe they're practicing Scrum and they're simply not aware of what TDE is because it's not something they do every day. Well, then or, the or what their developers are actually doing. Sorry, Nate. I just I was walked say all that over. The thirty percent is even more surprising. If there are fewer developers taking the survey, that just—I <laughs> mean, come on. I just don't believe that. I don't. I don't believe. And twenty-five percent are doing continuous deployment. I don't believe that for a second. Well, but but think about the people. So so to to think about the industry and the state of the industry. I mean, there are some elite teams out there. I mean, the, I mean, version one has a coaching practice. They send coaches out. They've coached teams on how to do version one, as has. You know, every other vendor out there. Uh, so there are those elite teams. I have to believe there's some correlation between customers who engage in those coaching services and people that might, you know, follow up by taking the survey. So you might see some teams out there that are highly mature for which their, their percentages are exaggerated in the survey sample. Well, I, if, if version one is, in, I would be highly surprised if version one's encouraging people to do pair programming. I'd you know, we use the tool, and I'm, I'm fine with the tool. I don't have anything against it. But there was nothing in that tool that encouraged pair programming at well, all. I, I don't know what it has to do with their tool, really, either. 
No, um, it does. It does. I think we're too focused on the tool. I mean, this is where version one, they have a full coaching practice that they'll come out and coach on how to use the tool, but they'll also coach on, on engineering disciplines to help you to help teams be successful with their delivery, regardless of if they're using the tool or not. Oh, so, they're, so they're let, doing good for them. Let's let's look at the agile techniques in, employed again. Uh, you talked about the sad faces, but like just in general, how uh, these different practices, like where where we think they should be. Like for me, the collective code ownership is pretty depressing to me. Yeah. Like yeah. if you if you are sitting on a team and you say, "Oh, I know about this piece of the the pie," or or this story is mine, nobody else can touch it, or I'm sorry, I can't touch that because that's not my story, then you're do, you're doing it wrong. Period. Like the the product as a whole, getting out the door at the end of an iteration or continuously, if you're doing continuous deployment, is everyone's job. The entire product. Yeah, but Amos, you don't realize how what you just said is scary to many people out there. It's like, oh what? my gosh. Because they don't like responsibility. Well, As they like little responsibility, but not big. I agree on that. And to me, that's a breakdown, not just on the person, but really on the team and the organization and the leadership of the team. Because the team should feel empowered and supported to have to take that risk. But at the same time, if that leadership isn't there for a team, and you're expecting someone to stick their neck their neck out and start helping with something that they may not be familiar with, you're making a lot of assumptions that are assumptions that some people will will buy into, but very few. Taking a look at these agile techniques employed, then, which one on this list surprises you the most about where it is in terms of ranking on the list? Good way or bad way? Either. Just overall surprise. Well, I mean, I already said about pair programming. Right. Uh, automated acceptance testing. Um, I, guess, I guess maybe I should go to continuous integration, but that's what I thought of when I read automated acceptance testing is that I'm actually surprised that it's so low. Um, I expected more people to like maybe believe that they're doing it. Um, not not great test coverage, but at least that they have one or two. Jason, Sarah. does anything pop out at you? Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, things that I that actually I've been doing a lot of work with lately, like well, agile games and cycle time at the bottom of the graph, really because no one really knows what those are. So those are trending positive. So I guess that's okay. Well, Kanban's at thirty nine percent, so it's going to be hard to do cycle time. Yeah, you. that's a prerequisite. The one that the one that I think is out there is it's interesting to see that coding standards is as high as it is. Um, you know, I wish that coding standards was replaced by a little bit more. If you could flip flop standards and collective code ownership, because I think people sometimes see coding standards as a way to say, "Oh, we've got these standards, so everyone can understand the code," and that almost becomes a barrier to actually achieving true collective code ownership. Velocity, uh, I think we can all agree, velocity is something that we could just remove that and focus on cycle time. So I, I'm also kind of depressed about unit testing. Yeah, I was looking. So at that. I mean, it's seventy two percent, which isn't anything to laugh at. That's pretty good. It's gone down two percent from last year, but these, I, I would assume that this is going out more toward people who are doing agile or at least attempting to, considering that a lot of people probably receive this because they are version one customers. So how is that not like w super close to a hundred percent? Like we have more people doing daily standups than we do people writing a unit test in general. I wish they would. That take, makes me cry. I wish they would take daily standup off. Yeah. I was going to say option. that John, I, cause I think that pollutes the data. And on top of that, you know, people do stand up and how, how often do you go to a standup that's actually effective? I think there's a lot of people that do standup and they kind of go through the motions and the standup in and of itself isn't as effective as it could be. I would just like well, to you, take it out of the take it out of the realm of things that people can point to to say we're agile because we have a standup. The one that shocks me and I, I can have a waterfall standup meeting. Sure. <laughs> the one that shocked me uh, was dedicated product owner. So it's at 55%, which is 
So I I think that's still low, but it's it's up from 2012 from 51 percent. So I'm I'm surprised I'm, it's that high. I'm shocked. I'm shocked that it's that it's that high on this survey, though. I think it should be higher. It, it doesn't surprise me a bit because this is the people that are taking this, as illustrated elsewhere in the survey, are are doing Scrum, and Scrum says you must have a product owner, and so therefore they have a product owner. Now, now the fact that they're dedicated, maybe that's a little surprising. But again, if these places are following the Scrum book that t- is doing, telling them what to do, the Scrum book says have a dedicated product owner, and so they, they do that because they feel like that's what they need to follow the recipe to be successful. Oh, and, let me, and, you know, let me re- ask this. Oh, go ahead, Amos. Refactoring. Is it just below 50%? Like, are you telling me that you never change code that was written in the past? Because no. you either have an amazing design or you just don't give a crap. <laughs> Who are these? What, what I don't get is refactoring is at 47% and TDD is at 38 Man, these, these guys have some cojones. If they are refactoring their code and they don't have tests. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, that's, and that is a step in TDD, right? Red, green, refactor. Right. So you're really not doing TDD if you're not refactoring. I'm sorry to tell you that, guys. But so I guess yeah, doing the, unit testing, whatever that is. So maybe that's that's what takes the takes the place of it. Well, the one that I want to throw out there that, that I think I'll, I'll ask is what do we think it means? Because in the um, in the survey, that was kind of that this question was presented pretty much like this. It was a big list you could choose from. So L integrated dev and QA. Yeah. What I do assume, we think that means? I ahead, assume Nate. that means that dev and QA are on the same team, as opposed to. Separate teams. I hope that's what they mean. Or they're not the same. Per- Could it be that they're the same person? I, I guess. Like every dev can also QA. I yeah, think it's I, yes I, to I both seri- of those. I seriously doubt that's what that means. Because otherwise, I'd be really excited about that. <laughs> I think they just mean there's not a QA department that you're throwing this over the wall to. That's. that's- I hope. Well, and, and there's so if that's all they put on there and people answered, who knows what they were thinking when they answered? Right, because they could mean yes, we do have a QA team. I don't know any of their names, but we have one. <laughs> oh, I'm not even going to say it. Well, <laughs> well, if we roll forward, okay, I think we've we've murdered the list of techniques. Um, okay. if, if you guys look at the leading causes of failed agile projects, um, this is something that kind of was what it was like last year. Of course, can we? People- can we- I mean, sorry, can we stop briefly on the Kanban uses graph? Like, Let's just like step through each section, even if we just say pass. What, what, just Kanban uses. Do you use it inside or outside your whatever, your organization? What, how is that a useful metric? What is that telling you? So that, that's that mean? Okay, so Nate, <laughs> Nate, I, uh, Nate, let me take that one. That saying is how, how much do you trust Kanban that you use it like in the, in the pit for the team? Do you show the board to the customer, like where they could peek in at it? Do you use it exclusively on the outside, like to show a feature board to customer, or do you do something else with it that's that didn't map to any of those three? I'm. Oh, you pointed it out to me now, Nate. I'm sorry. I don't mean to jump in here, but but I hate you. <laughs> it, inside of the the little example, it says Kanban or Scrumban. Come on, Scrum, like. Like what the hell is Scrumbon? Well, so okay, Amos. Well, let me educate you. So Scrumbon, <laughs> Scrumbon is when Scrum started. There was no Kanban. It was go ahead, do stories, do tasks within stories. Go ahead, put points on your stories, put hours on your tasks, do a big roll up, do a big roll up of it, and then do a burn down. That was Scrum. It it tools evolved, and it, you know people figure how to track it. Lean and Kanban became popular. And then they said, well, hey, let's put our Scrum tasks and our Scrum stories on a task board, and you know, kind of. Use Kanban, Wait, but as- if you don't have incoming incoming priorities changing, then you don't have Kanban. You, I guess that's Scrumbon. No, so that's, that's if Scrumbon. you if you tack your stories up on a board, that's Scrumbon. Yes, yeah, even so if it is fixed, backlog, fixed scope. The beginning of your sprint, yeah, everything's in your backlog, and then it flows through the Kanban. And when you've got everything through, you're at the end of your sprint. And, and oh my God, don't change any of the priorities in the middle of our sprint because we can't do that. That's the rules. Yeah, but at the same time, okay, okay. But Amos, Amos, out of the gutter, out of the gutter. Because think about it. And be, think about lean. You're, you're, if you're, if you're facilitating Scrumbon, I would say you should be using a pull system, and that will provide value. 
will help to overcome constraints, or at least it will identify where they are. So there's a value to that. Where I have just typically they, li- they put the two together. Where I have well, typically seen people use Scrumbon and the way they use it, the way it's described, is different. So it's it's more of Kanban with the Scrum ceremonies of retrospective demos, um, planning sessions, but but thought of more differently so that there's there's a continuous flow. And you guys mentioned starting off a sprint uh, with a, a set backlog and saying that sprint is done when the backlog was burned down. That's not that's not the way I've seen Scrum Bond done before. Okay. Well, what have you well, seen, I John? Hated that much. Like I said, con- a continuous continuous flow of work where uh, a short list of stories are prioritized in a to-do column and then worked and that you're wrapping more of the scrum ceremonies around that continuous flow process and taking, taking things like uh, iteration planning and not doing it as a single event, but spreading that out over the course of time, like you would with a normal Kanban approach. Well, and, and again, to, to what Amos, to what set Amos off, you know, calling it like it is, you know, Scrum was what? I think we're what, eight years into Scrum now? I mean, who's got the timeline? So eight years into Scrum, Lean and Kanban got hot about five years ago. So, you know, the market, you know, and the people, the practitioners merged them together. So, <laughs> oh shit, we better wrap a, a marketing term around this so that we can make it sound awesome. Well, some say that, you know, everybody needs a gimmick to sell something. And to be fair, someone said, here's a gimmick. I bet we can sell it. And guess what? The market bought it. So the rest Shh, is history. I have an ugly blog. That's my gimmick. For, for the sake of transparency <laughs> here, Amos, it, it sounds like you have a bit of sour grapes about Scrumbon. Um, no, no. As as you guys explain it, I'm I'm kind of okay with it. I'm like... It, I don't know. It feels I'm, I'm like very you... sad about the the half implementation of Kanban that I had pictured in my head, but it's not not near as horrible after you guys explain things. But it feels like you're like the Denver Broncos and Seattle just ran all up in your grill all over your oh, team. I have to tell and, you this. and and so, you you have sour grapes because your team <laughs> lost to Scrum. Yeah, Scrum bonds. <laughs> the just because you brought up the Super Bowl, I'm going to tell you about this. Don't uh, say that word. No. No. The, uh, there's a Ford dealership in the town that I live in, and it's a tiny town. And they made a deal that if there was a kickoff return in the first half and you bought a car in the last three days, they would just give it to you for free. Like, they would pay off your bill. They they sold 12 cars in the last three days, and there was a kickoff return. Like I wonder how sad they are right now. Well, no, because Amos, if you ever do one of those, you go and you get an underwriter, and the underwriter typically writes to that. And if you don't go and get an underwriter, then I don't know why you would do that because that's just bad business. So, so then you're then you're betting in, in Missouri. That's illegal. So what but, what happened no, there, no, Jason? No, that's called having a contest. I'm <laughs> moving, sure on. moving on. What Jason? What happened there was a tactic that many people use when they're uncomfortable talking about something, and it's called <laughs> deflection. Well, and or it's something it we should work, John. And or it's something we shouldn't talk about because you know, agile. We should be talking about people and not talking about contract negotiation. The things on the left are more important than the things on the right, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So going back to the Kanban uses thing, my point simply is that if they were going to ask a question about Kanban and draw some kind of conclusion, I, I wish they had done something a little more useful. This this does not really tell me anything. No. about how people are using Kanban or what it's for or whether it's helping them. The fact that they use it inside or inside and outside, I, you know, I, I don't really particularly care. So that's all I have to say. We'll have to skip that one. It's not, not a valid metric. What about agile portfolio management? How many people are practicing, not practicing, plan to practice, learning, and don't know what it is? The vast. So, so this to me is where we go back to the, the discussion from last year. That where is the complex correlation? Because I want to see, you know, across different verticals and different size teams, you know, who is practicing APM. My theory is that people from larger organizations and corporate IT environments might be betrayed into that, but you cannot correlate that from the way the data was presented. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right. So leading causes of failed projects. Here we go, Amos. Here we go, Amos. So the number one reason 
with the number one leading cause of projects, none of our projects failed. What do you think? <laughs> but so, the, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, it depends I just on laugh. I, I failed. I'm super excited about that. I'm really sad that it's only 15%. Well, that was the most popular answer of the survey. So, I thought Agile Project <laughs> couldn't fail because you always deliver something. Well, but we know projects that we, I mean, I'm, I think everyone in this, on the podcast here has been on a project that delivered. Uh, we delivered software, but uh, then something was not well received. So, yeah, you, even if it was well received, you may have walked away saying that project failed. Yes. I know. I was really being facetious. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, so that, again, that doesn't mean a whole lot because you don't know of those people are the ones, are they the ones that have only been doing it for two years or they, they've been doing it for 10 years or, or whatever. So that particular statistic, I don't think really is that helpful. And it's almost, I, I almost wish they had kind of left it off because it doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything and it, and it makes it look like since it's bigger than the others that somehow it's, it's more right or, you know, agile. Agile never fails or something. But if you're selling coaching, this this whole graph could be kind of an important thing of telling you where you might want to focus. Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I'm saying. I think the rest of it is helpful. Like, I think that's great for people that are working on Agile transformations or considering Agile for them to see, oh, here are the things we need to watch out for. I think the, I think the analogy is that, that 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 leading point on the survey about none of the projects failed that's the equivalent of having the stand-ups on the uh, the technique chart. Yeah, it is. It's not really helpful. It's, it's well, but by having it there, people choose it. It skews the metrics. So it would be nice to say, you know, in light of not being able to choose that, choose the next most important piece that you'd like to share with the community. Right. I love it how we end up cr critiquing the scientific method used to collect the data. Well, all, all I can say. <laughs> well, wait, wait. I have daily stand-ups, and my project didn't fail. Fantastic. I'm on the top of both graphs. I just mean you're like everybody else, Amos. <laughs> oh, that's true. Uh, I, will, yeah. I will assess you with my agile maturity model, Amos. <laughs> why, do, why do you think they put we, that of, Why do you think they so. put lack of experience with the agile methods down, you know, fourth in the list of actual reasons when it's higher? Uh, it, was there some, can you see some reason why those other two are somehow more important? I think that's a mistake. Interesting. They they sort al their the sort algorithm failed. Graph, the lack of experience with the Agile methods was 11%, and the two above it, external pressure to follow traditional water, waterfall processes and a broader organizational or communications problem were both 10%. Uh, because the sentences were longer and it made a nice uh, indentation there. There you go. <laughs> hey, it's all about design. Okay, so so yeah, I think I think I would agree with this in general that if your culture is at odds with core agile values, that's going to make it hard to to succeed in an agile project. And knowing that those are the harder things to change, so right. knowing that that requires people to buy in, it requires people to change the way they think, it requires that leadership dynamic I talked about, where people feel supported making that change. And those are the things that a lot of times people make PowerPoint slides and they have a big kickoff meeting. And they're like, yeah, let's go do it. And then everyone leaves and they go back to their old ways and things start to break down. Now, what I do find comforting, although I have another little, there's a little funny mistake at the bottom of the chart here. Insufficient training and new to Agile are both the uh, lower end, both at 3%, although somehow insufficient training is a larger 3%. Than <laughs> Agile's 3%. That's okay. But, it's because uh, they wanted it on top. <laughs> I, like, I like that because one of the one of the uh, concerns I've heard about Agile is, you know, we don't know how to do it. And so, you know, we're afraid to do it because we don't know how. And it, both of those point to that that's not a typical reason why your project might fail. I think that's a good sign. Yeah. Right. And, al and also that there's training beyond how to use an Agile tool. You know, there's training on really there's tra there's leadership training. There's training on the mindset, really talking about values and principles. There's training on the engineering disciplines. And at that point, if you've never done any of these things before, I mean, you need to do some learning. If you think you can, you know, read the book of Scrum or read the book of Agile and go off and be merry, unless your name's Amos, more than likely you'll need a little bit more learning. 
if they were, if they were <laughs> I I think I need a little more than just reading the book too. If they were hoping to craft this in a way to help sell more training services, they didn't do too great cuz mm. oh, I don't know the they nailed the it. They said it's insufficient training was oh no it's only a little bit of the problem. Never mind, not a lot. I said, John, I want to throw one to you. I'm on page six, and I want to, um, let's have the little coaches clinic. Dang it, wait, wait, wait. you got to stop. No. Move it forward. No. Tice, quit moving forward. <laughs> we must ship software. I don't like forward progress. We must ship software. This is scale. I got to write down, a, I got to make a document for a person. Um, <laughs> Please stop out of it. The unwillingness of the team to follow Agile is at 7%. I, I actually appreciate this. Like, I, I've run into many organizations where it's like 50% of the team that is unwilling to do so. So the lower that number is, the happier I am because it allows us to make a better transition to Agile. Well said. Okay. So moving on to the greatest concerns about adopting Agile. So number one survey says lack of upfront planning. So Tice, John, why do you keep skipping stuff? What? You want to talk about the, pick, the color dots? No. The balloons? <laughs> no, I'm picking what's important. So, so John, what can you coach me on? How do you overcome doing projects where we don't plan up front? Why would we ever do that? Jason, in, in answer to your question, I think both lack of upfront planning and loss of management control are kind of one in the same here. And, and what people are concerned about is from the corporate IT perspective, the lack of ability to forecast budgets to uh, um, assign assign budget money to projects and it's their concern that that they have they have a lack of of that control so the loss of management control along with the lack of upfront planning i think those two things go together now your question to me was how would i coach an organization to help them through this right yeah, so, so someone reads so one thing we we kind of talked about at the outset was you know this survey Kind of is a little bit has a little bit of a marketing spin on it. So someone reads this survey, they see about the lack of upfront planning. You're a coach. How would you coach people to overcome concerns they would have about the lack of upfront planning? I would say that the, the my traditional method here is to say that it's still important for organizations to go through their typical budgetary cycles, but that there's a certain amount of ambiguity that they're going to have to learn to be comfortable with. And as I've I think we've had this conversation multiple times, and as I've pointed out, the upfront planning that occurs in non in non agile IT shops is a facade. It is not real. That is not real planning. That is theoretical planning, but it is not planning that can be executed to the level that people expect that it can be executed to. So. It's this false, people have this false sense of, oh, we have a plan. We have a budget. Now all we have to do is execute against that. That is not the reality of how software gets developed when you have complex things like people involved, systems involved, users involved. That's just not the way software gets developed. So that's, that would be the course of conversation that I would have with someone as I'm coaching them on the discomfort that they have with a lack of upfront planning. You know, we covered, we covered most of this on the agile myths podcast, because as I'm looking through these, a lot of these are myths um, that, or that people are misguided about what they actually want, like lack of documentation, like lack of engineering discipline, which is kind of funny Um, because, you know, to what does engineering discipline mean to someone if they think that agile creates a lack of it? It probably means to them you're not fo- you're not um, producing all the charts that I would want you to produce or all the code comments that I'd want you to produce, and therefore you're not disciplined. When actually being agile, being truly agile, and creating um, systems that allow you to change them quickly requires a the top level of engineering discipline, and those who don't have that. Are, are doomed to failure eventually on their project. What do you think, Jason? Hmm. That was beautifully said, Nate. Yeah, it was. We're all speechless. <laughs> Amazing. 
Um, yeah, I don't need, I, I don't think we need to go any further on that little graph. I, I feel like anything that I say will not quite be as as profound as what Nate is already. Oh boy, laid a knowledge bomb on us. <laughs> well, or just that we, I mean, we can bring up trust again. We've talked about trust about a hundred times, oh, and loss yeah. of management control is a trust drink. problem. It's a drink, <laughs> drink, <laughs> communication. <laughs> this agile life drinking game. Yep. If someone says trust, you drink. <laughs> or communication. Or communication. Okay. Are we moving on? I think we move on. We kind of skipped a few pages, didn't we? Yeah, we kind of skipped around. You know, so so here's one issue I have with this survey going way back. So on page one, it says that about 88 of respondents say they are at least knowledgeable about agile software development techniques. <laughs> but if you go... 88 all, or 88%? 88%. <laughs> 88%. Oh, okay. okay. All the way down to page 8, it says 92% of respondents said implementing Agile improved their ability to manage changing priorities. So there's 4% of the people who have no idea what they're doing that are implementing Agile anyway. And it's helping. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing, and I'm still helping people. <laughs> this is awesome. Oh, anyway, All you have to do is use the word Agile. And you'll gain 4%. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> Go back to why Agile. Why? Agile? why? Well, I, I, I said why, because all I have to do is use the word and we gain 4% productivity. <laughs> I don't know. I don't find this that interesting, why people do Agile, but... Me neither. You want? Ice. Okay, Ice. all right. Hold on. This is interesting. <laughs> hold on. This is oh, oh, not important at all. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I was misreading the graph. So, manage distributed teams is not important at all for Agile. Is the like is the highest level of not important at all responses. That's interesting. So they they think Agile that that they don't. When, st when trying to figure out a way to manage distributed teams, Agile is not what they're going toward. No, because they want more control. Yeah. It just goes back to that last graph of loss of management control. Is once you go remote and have distributed teams, people want more control because they want to, they, they, they have to guarantee that people are working. Well, or, or to go back to our favorite drinking game, it's because they don't, just because they can't see people, they start to not trust them. So they feel the need to put up, you know, barriers and, and, and governance mechanisms and say, thou shalt do it this way. Thou cannot change the Kanban board. And, you know, so, and so you, you don't trust me because I'm distributed. So you put things in place to force me to fail. Yeah, because I can't see you. That's a hard thing to do. Um, uh, I know we all talk about it here, but a lot of people outside they 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 struggle, and and a lot of times you know I've worked with a lot of project managers that they don't realize that things they that they seem that they're doing to provide guidance are actually restricting people's ability to emerge and to exhibit emergent behavior to solve a problem. But I like to go across the street in order to get on the internet to download that library that you want me to have. Oh, that's a complicated <laughs> scenario. I mean, that's. <laughs> At the pizza <laughs> joint. Yes. So, well, I have a, uh, I, I kind of have a, I don't know how long we want to talk about this here, John, but the, I have an interesting kind of, call it a closing point almost. And that is that, you know, was you look and, you know, one of the things I said at the onset is that not much had changed in the story between last year and this year. Uh, this is no better evident. If you go to the picture, the, uh, the graph that's in um, on page 10 of the, lessons learned of agile adoption and literally within all of the things shown are exactly the same between last year and this year within one percentage point or one or two percentage points um exactly the same priority and literally exactly the same percentage points so the the the, the simple guidance that i'd provide and where i see value in the survey is if you're doing agile use this as an assessment tool so look at your executive sponsorship. Do you have executive sponsorship? If you don't, here's two years in a row. They've said that's one of the primary things you need to focus on. 
do you have a, a good do you are you disciplined at maintaining your backlog um and at the same time having workshops where people your product owners understand how to do that if you're not doing that and you're not satisfied with the results that you get this survey here provides some guidance of things that you could do and jason this page is particularly speaking to the state of scale agile and scaling of agile yeah i know but i i'm taking a step back and i'm saying across the board so uh, you know, some people say, well, what do I do next? Um, here's a here's a data point that says to do scaled agile and knowing to do scaled agile effectively, you have to be doing it effectively within within agile in the small. It's hard to scale to a larger size if you don't have your fundamentals down in your small teams. These are things you can do. And literally, you could use this as a way to score, you know, do a scorecard of your own practice to say, are you doing these things? And if you're not, these might this might give you some ideas of things to try. And what's interesting is they haven't changed from year to year. So what I want to know is what's with, you know, drawing all the employees as like full color rounded people and the contracted consultant is a scrawny looking stick person. I, I take offense. He's expendable. Me too. <laughs> what, he what doesn't is, have to have a personality because you're going to ditch him in three months anyway. That's right. He's interchangeable. <laughs> a faceless stick person. <laughs> he can't come in and do agile for us. Oh, that's a good question. Is there a subtle? Is there a subtle? Um, uh, is there a subtle meaning there? Knowing that. Oh, let's not bring up subtlety on this graph because then we can talk about how they're all men, also, and then we'll oh, just oh, fall into a black hole. Oh, just like a Volkswagen commercial during the big football game. Ooh. <laughs> just oh, like Amos is what to be a woman? How? Yeah, how we, <laughs> no. Just like Amos is a code retreat where he won't let any women attend. Hey. <laughs> I have a cabin with five beds, and it's all open space. I, Amos, uh, I don't Amos, know about you, but my, my Amos. comfortable with me inviting a woman to sleep in the same room as me. Amos, I think you're, you're again, you're being that project manager who's imposing those rules and regulations that may or may not add value. You're being a hypocrite. Okay? You should open the door and allow anyone who wants to to come in and understand they know what that full transparency. If they're okay with that, let them in. Oh, you're gonna, my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> this is going to be another I, fun I, podcast I for me to edit. That, uh, it, says, it says in here that it was increased by double digits on page 7, but the adaptation of Agile, 73% of respondents actually said that they had a faster time to completion because of Agile. That's cool. And it increased by double digits. Tice, one more, and then we need to wrap up. All right. All right, so I think the last I think the last thing we should close with everyone's favorite chart, the most important tool to agile success. What is it? Two years in a row. Everyone should know. Excel. Excel, Excel. yes. I mean every business <laughs> runs on Excel. That's all there is to it. Well, and then number two is Microsoft Project. Yeah, I just threw so, up a little well, bit. Those guys have uh, winning. That's all I'm saying. So if you look at the tool list, is there anything well actually there it is. There it is. I was surprised to see that that uh, actually this graph hasn't changed anything either. Wow, um, I was surprised to see that like Google hasn't gone up. So uh. There's a lot of people doing creative things with Google Docs these days, uh, and how that's not challenging Excel. I mean, Excel went down a little bit, but not that much. Did you notice that? Uh, well, I bet a lot of people even respond with Excel when they're talking about anything that is a. Um, whatever that's called. Agile uh, lifecycle management. A spreadsheet. <laughs> yes, thank you. Visicalc is what I was saying, but <laughs> we'll go a spreadsheet. All right, um, I, just, I have to call out one more before we're done that I think is funny. All if you back. say lean kit went up from 5% to 5%, <laughs> it's got an arrow going up, but both numbers are exactly the same. Okay. Uh, uh, it's it's back on page two. Who knows Agile? And I guess the question was, who on your project? Like maybe they sorted people in order. I don't know how they asked this question, but if, if what it is saying is that the only forty four percent said the Scrum Master was the most knowledgeable person on their team about Agile, that that makes me sad. I, I now if they, I, I hope there was some way to say we don't have Scrum Masters, but. Isn't that the entire point 
of the scrum master is to be the person that that knows agile the most and can coach everyone is that what that person is for no they know scrum the most All so right. this is this is out of a <laughs> this is based on 100% so they're ranking who knew the most but it, these numbers add up to 100% okay so and I think Nate, it's important to note. I mean, I've bumped into this that there's there's different opinions about what the scrum master's roles are. Um, and though everyone agrees, the scrum master is there to facilitate the process. And it's one thing to facilitate the process so it, a team is able to deliver, but it's another thing to facilitate the process at the same time you're coaching the process and coaching the team to deliver. I th- so I think this is sort of a force ranking of. Who on your project? I, I just hope the it's best. because they don't have scrum masters that more teams did not answer them as the number one. I would like to see this graph alongside the respondents and their position. Like, were forty four percent of the respondents the scrum masters? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and ten percent developers. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> then, then it starts to make sense. Okay, <laughs> all right, I'm done. All right. Well, here I'll do. A, I'll do. A, I'll do a wrap on this. So I think we need to. We've had. We've done this two years now. And well, 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 we we missed the most important graph for version one. Version one is going to ask us to quit doing this show if we don't hit the last graph. Well, they're going <laughs> to ask us to quit doing this show. That's for sure. <laughs> Wait, I was the waiting. percent of users who would recommend using a specific tool. Version one is number one at ninety three percent. Congratulations, version one. With a little star on it on the bar. Oh, of course, it's number one. Yeah. Hey. Amos, so, you interrupted Jason. He was about to do a rap. He said so. Well, my rap, <laughs> my, my rap was that. And I actually, this to me is a little call to arms for us. So we've been doing this you, for you two years. You need a beat beatbox so you can. No, no, no. This is this is a call to action. Not a. I, I, that's only my rap. So. Uh, having done survey work before, doing an effective survey is hard. I mean, you throw it out there. Sometimes you don't get the right data. You can't change it because it's out there. People are responding. I mean, it's hard to do. It's hard to design a survey that can produce effective measurements. So we've done this two years now. And again, I applaud version one. It's sharing information about the community. I think they've done a great job to help. You know, people are just starting or even if you're going through a transformation, this is great information to use to assess your current activities. If you're working with a vendor, use it to assess what they're doing. Maybe they're doing things the right way. Maybe the survey provides information. But since we've got a couple hundred subscribers and it's growing more and more and more, and it's going to grow more over the next year, what if we did a survey? You know, a true open survey, not affiliated. You know, no one here works for a company that makes a tool or sells a tool. And we simply, you know, ask people for their ideas. And if anything, maybe we get to eat some of our own dog food because I bet we would make a survey. We would try to correlate all these complex correlations we're talking about, and we might struggle ourselves. Anyone interested? I think Tice is in charge of it. So <laughs> Tice will make a survey. We'll put it out there. We'll ask our few hundred, our few hundred, hopefully soon to be thousand followers to to give it a shot, and we'll see if we get. It. You know, we'll be able to look at our distribution. You know, who are our listeners? Are we developer? Do the developers love us? Do the project managers love us? Um, I'm sure if you're a scrum master, you probably, well, after t- Amos's comments tonight, I don't know if you like us anymore, but <laughs> guess what, scrum masters? You guys are doing good work out there. You're helping teams deliver, so don't give up. Amos just needs to go read the book. Um, he'll get there one day. But we'll think about it. So maybe we'll see. We can p- talk about that in our Google community and see if we want to, you know, around this time next year, if we will maybe attempt to put something else out on the market. And then, hey, who knows? The version one guys, they can read our they can read our survey and they can do a podcast about how we're all wrong or how we could improve our measurements. I I will echo your comments about version one. I appreciate them doing the survey. I appreciate them making these results public. It would be nice if it were a, uh, a an independent entity of some sort that were doing it. Um, but no one is doing something this um this significant and and deep diving. So I do appreciate them doing that, even though we're we're poking a little fun in their direction. Well, here's what we do. We, we do a survey. We get the data. And it, it goes somewhere. I mean, it, it, I mean, I don't know if the alliance would want it, but it, to me, it would have value to, you know, publish it and put it out there somewhere, you know, for really sharing and saying, I mean, this is an industry. We've, you know, to the credit of the guys who signed the manifesto, you know, uh, what is it? 
13 years ago now. I mean, they created an industry that all of us are deriving our livelihood off of. So, you know, we should be thankful for that. Yeah. I'm excited about version one. I mean, this this is a fantastic thing. And who else can show me that 5% and 7% are a lot closer than 3% and 3%? <laughs> well, Amos, I'm going to make you in charge of the creative when we have to publish our survey results. And oh, that's I, a bad idea. And because all I can say is feedback is tough, and I'm sure you're going to put your little infographics out there, and everyone's going to start tweeting, oh, yeah, it's horrible, <laughs> whatever. So I won't even have infographics if you put me in charge. It'll just be numbers. You're like your beautiful, your beautiful, <laughs> your beautiful lack of design web page, right? Ugly, dirty right. information. Ugly. Yes, you're a very ugly blog. It's, it's dirty. Information. Dot <laughs> <laughs> com. Dot com. Right. Oh boy! So we'll be sure to put the links. I know version one does like to um, uh, does like to track who's looking at their survey. So we'll put the link on the show notes of how to download this survey if you didn't by chance get the direct distribution email. So, In case Google's not tracking you enough, you can let version one track you the extra um, percent. Again, to be fair, I mean they okay. So <laughs> no, no, Amos, so Amos, what they did cost money. They had to I, I survey. Don't... They are entitled to use that, okay? It's Agile is a business, okay? I, I joke, but mainly it's because I like to see your face after I say something like this. I know, I need to work on my hand here, just like, <laughs> just like Bill O'Reilly and the president before the, big, before the big football game, yeah. What about the hand? They were giving it to both of them. It was awesome. Oh, and by the way, they didn't build the back end of the of the healthcare.gov site, so you can actually do um uh, you can actually do uh, claims now. You can sign up, but you can't pay. So great, and you finished the project. This week's hottest picks, and let's start with Jason tonight. Okay, so I have um I have three tonight. Um, so the first one I thought I'd throw out there is an interesting book that I picked up uh, about a month ago by Marty Green. It's called Painless Performance Discussions. It's a book that really talks about how to do employee reviews if you have to do that. Um, and what I took from it is a lot of kind of ideas and techniques to give constructive criticism. If you're a coach and you, you, know, you have to coach people on the team that um, maybe have some anti-patterns, it was a really good, um, gave me some new ideas, which I appreciated. Uh, it's similar to Crucial Conversations by Kerry Patterson, which is a more of a business or a, a selling focused book about how to have that. But this is, again, a book. It's just like Crucial Conversations, but it's focused more on providing constructive criticism. Um, so that's two. Pay this, uh, the Pay This Performance Discussions and Crucial Conversations. Number three, since I can have as many as I want because this is not governed, there is no governance on this Agile Life, is um, a while back we had our episode talking about the new year. And so we had that idea of this idea of the people work here activity that we wanted to challenge people to put up. So I've done this on a team now, and I know a few other people uh, did people work here. and They, they put it out on Twitter. So uh, we'll put some information up about how to facilitate a people uh, work here activity. And it'd be great to have some other people follow up. And as the New Year's continuing on, do something to help the team that they're working with, be it if they're on a team or if they're a coach, you know, help that team understand some of the human factors that are important to the members of the team so they can be successful. Great. Good picks, Jason. We're going to have to go ahead and get those t-shirts printed up that Amos suggested that say people work here and have uh, this agile life on them somewhere. I'm pretty excited and please, uh, as Jason said, keep putting up your pictures of signs that say people work here. Uh, you just make me smile from ear to ear. Amos, what, what's hey, your pick? Jason, tonight? is that book Painless Performance Conversations? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. I think I have it wrong. I'm trying to add it to Goodreads, and I just want to make sure I have the right link. I will check. I need to use my Kindle. Oh, uh, Nate now has to pick Goodreads tonight. <laughs> yep, Goodreads. Okay, go ahead. Amos, what's your pick tonight? <clears throat> um, so, so my pick is, just to, to be honoring and go back to my scrum feeling, is uh, Martin Fowler becoming relevant again with a uh, an, an article called Flaccid Scrum. Just, just go and enjoy that. And since uh, Tice brought up the uh, um, the, the healthcare.gov website, you can go to healthsherpa.com and and fill out the find out what you're going to pay under ACA without all the overhead of putting in uh, your name and and all that information. You just need your um, your birth date and your zip code, 
and it was put together by some guys in San Francisco in like 48 hours or something it, like that. It's so a it's data.gov cool. project. You get the rate tables for the Affordable Care Act off of data.gov, and they just made a website for it. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Amos. Nate, what's your picks tonight? So uh, I've got a couple of picks. One is this uh, website that I think um, all of us who are in the consulting industry would find uh, maybe painfully amusing, but I think everybody would find amusing. It's called Clients from Hell. And uh, it's just these little conversations that people have had. It's mostly people, I think, in the graphic design industry, but it's these little conversations that people have had with their clients that are pretty hilarious, um, where clients just really don't understand what it is that, that, their, uh, that their consultant does for a living. Um, and so it's pretty funny. And uh, I've started following it on my, you know, I added it to my feed reader. Um, it's, it's always just pretty darn amusing. So um, anyway, that's, that's one. My second one is a book that was um, written in 1984 by Eli Goldratt called The Goal. And it was kind of um, the precursor to the Phoenix Project, which I think was a pick on a previous podcast um, by me or someone else. But it's a, it's a novel about a manufacturing plant that um, is in big trouble and begins following uh, lean processes, although they don't really call it that in the book. Maybe in 1984 it was called something else, but uh, starts figuring out, um, use, mainly using theory of constraints is what it looks like, um, to how to get uh, their plant out of trouble and, and knock down their uh, inventory and uh, increase their flow and all that kind of stuff. So it's the, it's, it, it really explains what it is that these these basic ideas that we talk about in Lean do, and gives you an idea of what um, how how they work and why they work. And it was it was for me it was good to go back to something that's constantly being talked about in the software world and look at why it works in the manufacturing world and really get an understanding of it to help me really understand how to apply those principles better in software. Great, Nate. Good picks. You mentioned your feed reader. I'm wondering with uh, I don't really use a feed reader anymore since Google, the Google one went away. What are you using nowadays? Uh, uh, as an app, I'm using Feedly. F e e d l y. It, it's it. I like it better than the Google Reader um, app I had before. And it actually read. It's probably it's too late now, but it read my Google Reader feed and and you know sucked it all in and. I just was able to keep moving along with, with Feedly. So. Excellent. Okay, uh, I have one pick tonight, and I kind of struggled to come up with something, so take it for what it's worth. Um, for Twitter, I use something called Hootsuite. I've actually purchased uh, an account to use Hootsuite, and it's I find it very beneficial because I can do a lot of searching and I can save searches. And uh, the way I use it most commonly is that I... I have a number of saved searches in there for things like Agile and uh, and Scrum, etc. A number of things that I then I go in and I look at those, and I when I get on social media and I try and engage with people uh, with comments about Agile, etc. And I also look for tweet shoutouts from our community. So if you'd like to send us a tweet shoutout about the program, you can tweet us at this Agile Life. Okay, guys, uh, that's all we have this evening. I'd like to uh, thank you all for joining us. It's been a very spirited conversation tonight. Amos, Dirty Mr. Dirty Information, Mr. Ugly <laughs> Blog, where can people find out more about you? Well, of course you have my ugly blog, dirtyinformation.com, or you can find me on GitHub or Twitter at adcron, A-D-K-R-O-N. I look forward to hearing from you. And as always, you can find me on our Google Plus community. And Jason, Mr. Jason Tice, where can people find more about you? I would love to be a member of the Google Plus community. John just needs to re-invite me. I feel so excluded. John, please do not invite him. Yes, I would love oh. to come to the cabin. And since I'm not allowed to do that, you have to find me online at www.theagilefactor.com or on Twitter at The Agile Factor. And Nate Mackey, where can folks find out more about you? Well, uh, except for the weird way I pronounce my last name, it's pretty easy to find me. Uh, Nate Mackey, N-A-T-E-M-C-K-I-E, uh, on Twitter. And then uh, if I write blog posts, it's usually for 
Uh, the company I work for, Asynchrony. So it's blog.asynchrony.com. That's A-S-Y-N-C-H-R-O-N-Y. And you guys can find more about me, John Sextro, at my website, johnsextro.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at JC Sextro. Be sure to check out the show's website at thisagilelife.com to find the show notes for this podcast and all of the other show notes for all of our past podcasts and all of our picks from all of our previous shows and a lot of information out there about uh, the host. And you can also join our private Google Plus community by going to thisagilelife.com slash community. Thanks for listening and keep living this agile life. This Agile Life is brought to you by a community of agile developers and coaches aspiring to spread the word about this groundbreaking approach to software development. Join us at thisagilelife.com forward slash community.